Hi there, in today's video we're looking at what is SaaS, so software as a service, and that will be from a SaaS founder's perspective or potential SaaS founder's perspective, if that's something that you're interested in getting into. I have a separate video on this channel that talks about SaaS from the end user, the customer, the decision maker's perspective, but this one is all about the business model. So we'll cover what it is, some examples of it, the benefits and drawbacks of it, and how you can get started building your own SaaS app. All right, so. Let's first start with the definition. So uh, SaaS, in my view, is subscription-based software delivered over the internet. The users are effectively renting the software instead of purchasing a lifetime license. And SaaS owners are going to benefit from a reliable recurring income as a growing user base compounds over time. And the time is leveraged that you put into this uh, SaaS app because you've built it once, you're going to sell it to many people on an ongoing basis. Alrighty, so that's the definition of it. And in terms of some examples, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the big SaaS apps, but in the collaborative space, you've got things like Gmail, Office, Slack, um, that are all gonna be uh, charging a monthly or annual fee you know, for users to, to use that software. And same in the sales and CRM space. So you've got things like Salesforce, HubSpot, and Monday.com. And in accounting, uh, to pick another area, you've got zero, um, QuickBooks and Sage. So in terms of the benefits of SaaS, the number one thing is a recurring reliable income. Instead of starting at zero every single month, like you would if you were paid per day or on, on active sort of income, active project work, uh, you're starting at a place where you've already got a core set of subscribers and you're just trying to increase that as you go each month by making the app better, adding more features, uh, spreading the word about the app. Um, and that reliable recurring income is the biggest thing uh, about the whole business. It's uh, the number one thing that makes it one of the most attractive business models out there. And the next thing is also this leveraging of time and effort. So when you build this app once, uh, you're going to be then selling it to many people. And many people are going to be benefiting from it. So many people will be paying you that subscription fee each month. So you build it once, sell it to many. Next, we've got low risk to get started. So depending on the level of investment, and most of the small apps will start off with just the time investment from a single founder, um, unless you are going for a big, huge uh, SaaS app, which obviously then tends to have in a, like a, a seed investment and then multiple rounds, multiple series of investments after that for venture capitalists and things like that. Those are multi-million dollar SaaS apps. Um, but if you want, you can start small, just invest your time, see if it works. If it's starting to get some traction and momentum, then you can build it up and uh, invest some money or go out to get some investment if that's what you want. Uh, next, uh, you can scale the app and the team as the income grows. So as you're saying, as it builds momentum, you will then scale up the teams within it. You might not have a dedicated sales team to start with. You might uh, bring that on board once your user base hits a certain level and it warrants that the income you're getting allows you to, to make those, those investments in your team. There's a large pool of investors and venture capitalists uh, available for funding your uh, SaaS apps if you've got a good business plan. Uh, the, it's one of the most attractive business models for these VCs to invest in. Uh, they expect actually quite a lot of the apps to fail and not grow um, as a business, but the ones that do grow really can have substantial um, rewards on the other side of it. And that leads us to the next point. There's huge potential exits once you get this subscription model building up and building up. Uh, the exits that you can get off the back of that are obviously huge compared to other business models where it's let's just say it's project-based work and there's a reliance on people going out and getting clients is not this naturally recurring reliable income that we've seen in point one all right so let's have a look now at the drawbacks of SaaS from a SaaS founder's perspective so firstly there is investor funding so uh, with that comes high pressure targets and uh, it's not like you can casually just see how this thing goes they're going to have these key performance indicators and metrics that you have to hit by certain deadlines to qualify for the next level of funding. 
uh, there's going to be more pressure for um, stringent sort of data security and uh, compliance and procedures from your bigger customers as your customer base grows and the size of your customers grow to more enterprise scale. So the third thing is potential copycats. Um, because your software is out there in the big wide world, people can take up a free trial or they can take it up for a subscription up for a month and have a look at the features of the app. And then potentially someone could look to try and spin up a competitor to your particular app. The best way to combat that would be to have the best in class app and the best in class support service, always be on top of support, always be adding new features and be in touch with your user base. Other downsides would be balancing customer requirements uh, versus making reusable features. So uh, as you get bigger uh, enterprise clients that will be um, more demanding of you for certain requirements and features and they will expect the app to be like a bespoke app for them for the amount of money that they're paying and it's balancing that uh, expectation with the fact that you're building reusable features across your whole user base can be quite uh, challenging. Um, you've also got to bear in mind there will inevitably be some level of customer churn that needs fighting uh, to make sure you're on top of that and trying to minimize that percentage of churning customers. And then there's going to be this expanding support. So as more clients come on, they're going to potentially need more uh, support in getting set up and ongoing queries that they might have or issues they have with the application. So that's going to need some resource, um, whether that's a, a team you start with at the beginning, or if it's just something that you would then scale up as these uh, support requests come in at a higher level. So if all that sounds a little bit daunting to you with the investor funding, the high pressure targets, and this data security and the compliance about dealing with enterprise scale customers, you can start really small. And there's something I wanted to introduce you to here, which is called MicroSAS. It's exactly the same as SaaS, except it tends to be basically much more narrowly focused. So it solves a specific problem for a specific niche audience. Uh, it's run by a single founder or a small micro team, and it's typically got no external funding or very little sort of seed investment. So you don't get all the high pressure milestones that we were talking about earlier. And on this channel, I talk about MicroSaaS and how to get started. And I've got a video on what is MicroSaas? We're going into more details on the examples, but just to give you a brief flavor of what it is, um, these are apps that are run by just a single founder or a small micro team. And they're not just web apps, they're also things like browser extensions. So we've got this browser extension, so one called Closet Tools, Merch Wizard, which is one that I built. Uh, we have got Shopify plugins, we have got uh, WordPress plugins, desktop apps, and uh, these are the sort of apps that you can build for a small niche. And they will love you for it because you're solving their problems. And because you're only one or two people, you don't have all the sales teams and marketing outlay, the office outlay and all that stuff. Certainly at the beginning, um, you can earn a disproportionate income you know, for, for the amount of time that you put in. So if we pick this Closet Tools app, that's run by a guy called Jordan O'Connor and he, is one of my favorite MicroSaaS examples. He started working on this uh, script to help automate some of the tasks that his wife was doing when she was selling uh, some clothes on Poshmark. And the Closet Tools app basically became a product that he built from that starter script. And he realized that a load of other Poshmark sellers would benefit from it. And he then scaled that up to a point where he was earning over $30,000 a month as a single developer um, developing and working on this Chrome extension. This Super Lemon is a Shopify product that uh, basically allows them to have a WhatsApp integration with your Shopify store for instant WhatsApp chat. And that was built you know, by a, a pair of uh, developers and that again scaled up to 30,000 plus um, a month. So these are just examples of things where people have started, they spotted a problem, they fixed a problem, they scaled it up. In some cases, they've gone on to sell, to sell and exit you know, from that business as well. So MicroSaaS is basically what I cover on this channel predominantly, but I also talk about passive income, how to quit the day job as a software developer and Chrome extensions, how to build them and monetize them as well, because that's really where my expertise comes in. So if any of that resonates with you, then please subscribe and uh, drop a like on the video. And we also have a Facebook group, which I'll link in the description of like-minded MicroSaaS founders 
they're very friendly, help each other out. So there's no stupid questions in that group. And if you tag me in any of the questions, I will always do my best to answer as well. So hopefully see you in the Facebook group and I'll see you around. Cheers for now.